right, welcome, welcome back, everyone, to the second episode of our uh, first series, Wintering. Really, really excited about this one, and to bring on our first guest of the series, um, who has been to the World Athletics Championships two times as a pole vaulter in 2009 and 2007, uh, the Olympics in 2008, European Championships 2006, 2009, 2010. <laughs> she also won uh, bronze in the Commonwealth in 2010 as, as well. First junior vaulter to first female junior vaulter to go over four meters. Uh, and in 2009, uh, you broke the British record nine times, both indoor. That was a good year. <laughs> good year. Yeah. Good year. Six <laughs> in the world championships in Berlin that year. Uh, really excited to bring on Kate Rooney, former denizen, to the podcast. And, and, and now she coaches in Loughborough. How many athletes do you have now? I don't like to count. <laughs> don't like to count. Several, no, several athletes. Yeah. Several athletes. It scares me if I have to count them. No, I think I've got a, a twelve. Let's call it twelve. <laughs> some, some are, some come in from other areas and train, and some are full time in Loughborough. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. you said before we jumped on, busy. you like being busy. So I guess twelve athletes yeah. will do that for you. <laughs> yeah. But we really appreciate you coming on. This is this is really exciting. That's the longest intro that I've ever had to do. So we're we're we've made it, Matt. We've made I know, it. I know. I'll... You just put me down memory. Yeah, our intros would just be a sentence long, David. We're not that um, interesting, are we? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was a nice little walk down memory lane. There, it was good. <laughs> well, speaking of memory lane, uh, we can't breeze yeah. over the fact that you've been to the Olympics and with well, World Championships. Olympics must come with some unbelievable memories. Um, what's one that stands out to you in the Olympics? Just going there, experiencing the whole thing. Like, is it just the competition like what's one that that just stands out to you um for us having london as the home games was obviously it, it was a bit of a stressful lead up to the olympics to make the team they made it quite hard but obviously making the team and obviously warming up and like just putting on a british vest in front of eighty thousand people like all I wanted to do that day was clear a bar. I only managed to clear one bar, but if you cleared a bar, you had 80,000 people roar when you did it. And I had that feeling, it was phenomenal. No one can ever take it away from me. That particular Olympics didn't end so well, but um, yeah, I think still having that memory of actually clearing that opening height and just having like everybody behind you was an amazing, amazing feeling. Um, but I think like behind every Olympics or behind every championships, you've always got your own goals and obviously, that then quite often trumps any feelings that you have on the day yeah. if it doesn't go your way mm. so yeah did you did you get to experience the opening ceremonies and and no oh. um, unfortunately not like they they kept us they kept us away from it all so we were in portugal at the time on like um our uh, holding camp um, they kind of let us watch it on a big screen and they made us put all our um, opening ceremony outfits on <laughs> while we just kind of tried to soak in the moment. But at the same time, I think because athletics is always in the second week, like quite often you get this huge buzz, buzz from the opening ceremony and they, they didn't want us to have the buzz and then come down, mm. if you know what I mean, and then have to build up again. So I think that was the theory behind it. Um, so no, I didn't get to, oh, same in Beijing, they did the same. They kept us in the holding camp in Macau. Um so yeah, unfortunately, didn't didn't ever if, get if to If you had that. the opportunity to change it, would you have wanted to be at that opening ceremony? Oh, it's um, it's a very good question. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think they make they make better TV spectacles than they probably are there. There's a lot of for the athletes that's waiting to go on, if you know what I mean. And all they do is they keep you and waiting to go on um, for quite a long time. The same way we've done it in the closing ceremony and like London closing ceremony was pretty, pretty epic. Um, so I, I don't know. I don't know if I fully feel like I've missed out. I kind of, yeah, you always wanted to walk in on that with that posh yeah. suit and <laughs> wave. For that's when, um, when the queen jumped out. <laughs> but, um, well, obviously not the queen, but like, you know, yeah. the, the little stunt double. Yeah, the, the, the stunt double. That would be awesome. Um, yeah, oh, they did a good job. I definitely was proud to be British. Yeah. I didn't see that. I, would they Would they get a stunt double that's, like, also the Queen's age? So it it's like just it. Some, it like it. Also elderly. <laughs> elderly women yeah definitely who's not, not just not afraid to do that it was a, no 
She was like eighty something. It was Rowan Atkinson again. as well, wasn't it? He was there just, uh, wasn't he, with the little piano? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Right. That was one of the best ceremonies I've ever seen. To be fair, yeah, it was pretty good. It was it. It was very, very impressive uh, to watch ch- from a big ch- screen ch- in Portugal. Portugal's not too bad of a place to be, though. <laughs> yeah, there's worse places you can watch it. <laughs> no, we got treated. We got treated well. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> Um, so, yeah. so I guess I will continue this tree, this uh, theme of memory lane. Just pole vault is is such a rogue event, <laughs> and and just how did you get into it? Like, just run us through your career, just very very quickly. How did you get into it? When did you know that like actually I've got a I've got a chance here to do something special? Um, yeah. yeah. I, uh, fortunately, my story is pretty standard. I was a failed gymnast. <laughs> um, and quite often, um, you know, I, I got to a decent level in gymnastics, like national level, just always had that goal of going to Olympics as a kid, watching the Olympics as a kid. My background was watching the gymnastics rather than athletics, but very sporty family. Um, and then, yeah, just kind of went down to the local athletics track, fancied myself as a sprinter and realized I wasn't quick enough for that either. <laughs> So then um, somebody said, oh, you did gymnastics. Why don't you try pole vault? Um, And there was uh, another lad, Steve Lewis, who actually went on to be a fantastic pole vaulter as well. So um, he was from the same gymnastics club and also probably too tall and failed gymnast as well. So both of us ended up in the same pole vault group. He was a couple of years younger than me. But um, uh, and I think it's one of those strange things. I think as a gymnast, I was working my butt off, training three hours a day after school. and like six days a week, making sort of maybe top five nationally, which was good, but I don't think I was ever going to take it on to the next step and get into the internationals, get an international um, cap, I suppose, at that stage. Um, and then like in athletics, um, you know, doing pole vault, I think it was only like um, like an England representative schools level. I think they call it SIAB now, but um, I sort of did that within a year and I took to pole vault quite quickly. Like I think... I started late at sort of 15, 16, you know, did 320 um, and then 380 in my second year and then four meters in my third year. So as you said, like first junior to British, but like within two to three years. So yeah, I took to it quite easily. Um, I, I stumbled around the four meter block, if you know what I mean, and found a social life and various other obstacles along the way. But um, yeah, I think you then become addicted to success and just fell in love with the event. That's really that's that's really cool. I mean, to go on your first year and do three twenty, I don't know if I could do three twenty in <laughs> ten years. I've seen you. I've seen you, David. You could do it. I've that's seen you doing the pole vault drills. Yeah. He's drills, a yeah. drills I can do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Just get my tight hamstring and let go. Just shoot me across the gym. <laughs> You'll be fine. You'll be fine. <laughs> uh, so, um. Yeah, this first series talking about wintering and, and off season training or winter training, I guess as you would say. Yeah. Um, as as an athlete, did you did you enjoy that time? Yes. Um I was one of those weird ones that kind of enjoyed the winter grind. Um my f- sort of coach I mean, I don't really remember it pre going I I did I went to university um at at Staffordshire and then I only moved to Loughborough at 21 so I don't think I ever experienced the winter grind before 21 like I was still training sort of two to three times a week when I was a university athlete maybe maybe three three to four but um I definitely wasn't in this kind of full-time program that you have in Loughborough that you're able to access an 18 year old um so I was 21 I think I was a little bit more ready for it although having said that my coach that I moved to Steve Rippon was he was a big believer in the winter grind and you know I've seen you running around doing those those 1k reps David but we did that too so like for a pole vaulter I remember starting winter training with like three 1ks or something (laughs) blew my mind and I was not like I'm like anything over 150 150 meters is quite far for me um so yeah I kind of enjoyed the challenge of it though because it was out of my comfort zone um, and just getting stronger as well. Like, again, I hadn't probably done much of a weights program before 21. I'd done weights, but uh, learned to lift and some of the key um, lifts but uh, and movement patterns. But I wouldn't have said I had a full um, experience of winter training before 21. Um, so, 
yeah, I think I did enjoy the challenge and it was just so far different from anything I'd ever done. I'm not sure how relevant it was, but <laughs> I did enjoy it. So so what um, sort of w did wintering mean to you when you first came across it? Was it just, I'm just going to get into this sort of like, I'm training in the winter or is it a time where I'm going to recuperate, rehab, uh, rehab any issues or is it a time where you're just going to, as you said, like put that grind in? Yeah, I mean, at, at 21, um, I hadn't had too many, I think I'd had shin splints, but I hadn't had too many injuries or anything like that. So I think for Steve, it was turning me into an athlete. I was very raw still, like I jumped four meters, but not from having a big physical background. And I think his belief was, let's turn them into athletes first, and then we can work more on technical. And, and he, don't get me wrong, he was a phenomenal technical coach. First thing he did, you know, I was on a longer run up on longer poles. He brought me back down into shorter run ups and short approach uh, poles. So he taught me how to pole vault. Um, but yeah, there was in the midst of um, some very heavy physical training, which um, again, I feel like I got away with by being a little bit older. Um, rather than some of the youngsters that sometimes came in, they might not have been able to handle what was thrown at them. Um, but I was also, I, I don't think I questioned very much. I kind of just did as, as I was told at that stage. I was, I didn't think I knew that much about the event, if I was honest. I wasn't one of these kids that had been doing it from like nine years old that studied it, YouTubed it, you know, I just kind of, I just wanted to be better. Um, and if I had someone that could help me do that and Steve had, had a good record of making athletes better so I thought he must know what he's doing yeah it, it's so it's so interesting um because athletics is the first sport that that I've encountered where off seat like well winter training or off season training you do with your coach as well uh, coming from ice hockey background, the season would end in whenever spring or summer, and then you would do maybe you'd have your off season two weeks or whatever before you went back into training. But you wouldn't do that with your team. You would do that. Yeah. You'd have your own S and C coach and your own program and skills work, and then you wouldn't go back to your team until like the, well the preseason. And yeah. and and did you? <clears throat> I guess. I, I'm not sure how gymnastics works, but did you did you find that strange as well, or did you quite like that having that off like that off off season of doing nothing and getting right back with the coach? Did you have a yeah. different experience where it wasn't like that before? Yeah, gymnastics. I had no idea. We just seemed to train hard all year round, and there seemed to be competitions that popped up, and you did them. That I didn't feel like there was ever a process, and so yeah, coming to athletics um where you had like you know the summer season then you'd go to winter then you you look enough for a pole vault and uh, you'd have an indoor season as well um and then you would do a little bit more of a a re well we called it spring prep i suppose um which would not be go quite as deep as the off season um i, th I don't i don't know if i really overthought it that much at that stage again um like it was obviously for us it's a chance to make technical changes as well um and so like you go on work on short runs and there's a lot more process involved that I'd ever had before um and so yeah I I just kind of went along with the flow of it um it was very tiring as I said the program was huge it was a very high volume program and I think with Steve he often had new ideas and new ideas would come into the program but nothing ever came out so <laughs> training just increased 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 year on year in and I like I mean I mean it started with him at the end of 2005 no 2005 um and uh, yeah, he moved on to um, move up to Scotland in 2010. So I sort of had five, six years with him. But yeah, it was it was it was quality stuff. But um, there was a lot. So I think it was just finding that balance of not making us too tired, um, that you could actually get what you wanted out of it. But yeah, I suppose it was hands on time with your coach. I mean, if you're going to call it really off season, I always get my guys to do a little bit of physical prep before we start our off season, so that they're just a little bit ahead of mm. you know if you want to start pole vaulting straight away um you're not raw to it mm. if you know what i mean yeah especially some people's off season is a different <laughs> different topic as we talk yeah. about yeah 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 matt 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 kate thought we were going to come in and talk about off season is like where's the best <laughs> where are the best bar spots in uh ibiza <laughs> <laughs> that that's our off season off oh, season is downtime yeah, yeah. <laughs> in, in our lingo <laughs> so oh, that's funny so yeah but yeah go go ahead go ahead matt i think you had something to say there 
Oh, he's gone. Yeah, we lost him. Oh, well, he'll come back. I'll say something. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say something. <laughs> fill the back. time but, uh, until he comes back. Um, so do you think as a coach now, because you went through being an athlete and now as a coach, that uh, your off-season or how you kind of approach, I guess, coaching as a whole, but off-season off or wintering specifically, uh, was was influenced by your coach or by your experiences as an athlete and can can you see that um in how you approach wintering with your athletes yeah 100 percent. so like i mean my first coach steve Rifkin, taught me from four meters to 460 so i believed what he did was correct so when i first started coaching uh, in 2013 I kind of replicated what he did because I thought right that's worked for me let's do that and I think a lot of coaches start out their journey replicating when they've come from being a decent level athlete they replicate what they um they did um and I soon deviated a little bit away from that realizing that um not every athlete would be able to handle that and you can't make all the technical changes that I wanted to make when they were tired um and uh, yeah, they just not everybody could handle that volume, and I either made some serious mistakes with some athletes, and um, unfortunately, as you start your coaching journey, you do make a lot of mistakes, and hopefully, you make less mistakes. <laughs> but um, as you go on, um, and then yeah, over the years, it's constantly changed, um, and I'm, obviously, you come up with new ideas, you come up with different ways of doing things. And um, for me, it's just finding that balance between. You know, I, I want the athletes that I coach to have a long career. So I believe that in an element of a base. Um, so I do think there's got to be some grind and some of that grind sometimes can um, make the, the the pole vaulting and the technical changes that we've set up harder. Um, but then at the same time, it's like finding what's relevant to actually being a pole vaulter. And obviously, like, there's a there's a limit to how hard you can train and make physical and make sorry technical changes. So yeah. Um, yeah, it's constantly a balancing act. Like um, this year I've played with some different ideas and they've worked really well. And I feel like this year has been one of my, the best years so far. I mean, we're only in week eight. We've got another four weeks to go. But finding a good balance between making the technical changes um, and still getting a bit of graft. Um, but yeah, it's it's constantly evolving. And then obviously the longer you work with an athlete, the more you know about that athlete. And it's going to be slightly different for every athlete. Um and at the moment, one of the athletes I've worked with lo like the most has been Ellie McCartney, um, who came to me just post lockdown, like, um, and just watching her and obviously the the physical prep has changed over the last few years, but actually seeing the results this year that she's become a lot physically better um, is really interesting and it's taking less out of her. So that graft work where we still manage to make changes and improve, but maybe not as many technical changes is now paying off now that she's just got a better level of base so when she comes back to me this year in her third year or fourth year I don't even know how long <laughs> but um then you know like we can put quite a lot of more specific work for her on top of that um so it's been quite exciting and uh, yeah following on what you said about that balance between technical and actually working on physical attributes one thing I noticed was um watching that untold stories swamp kings I thought or something like that with the Florida um football team and you got there's a clip of tim tebow and a bunch of those other american football lads in the gym just pumping like doing i don't know 50 reps on bicep curls and you know trying to get massive and in the end like you also mentioned the longevity factor is those players won the you know they'll win all these games or they'll possibly win the season but you look at those players the next season and they're all spent it's like they were just trained for that one yeah. season and then the rest was like, we'll see how they get on next season. But their bodies are total. They've had no rest. So, yeah, it's just it's just that hard balancing act. And, I mean, now now you're coaching. Are there – I mean, you, you just mentioned some points there really about, like, how the different considerations you've had in terms of, like, as you were an athlete and now being a coach, what you've had to understand yourself. Um, yeah, I just – what was the hardest part of wintering? Was it the mental – side of things as well because i remember you mentioning that some of those athletes the younger ones wouldn't be able to cope as well as you did in a way yeah um definitely the mental side is tough like the winter grind is usually roughly around 12 weeks it's 12 weeks generally without a competition without a you know something to take you out of that grind we don't tend to go warm weather training or anything like that in that 12 weeks so you know it's the same fall walls week in week out yes we might microcycle and have recovery weeks and download 
weeks in that time but um it can be draining and then like i always said to the guys like this time around that that middle prep now that we're in is where like this we're still making some we're trying to make technical changes on longer runs which is harder to do and i'm just finishing off the last bit of the physical so sometimes there's a little bit of a dip in quality but like coming out of this like hopefully some of the volume will drop in the next prep um as we prep for the competition season mm. um and i think i think that can get pretty pretty tough tr- pretty mentally draining when you have a bit of a down like the girls specifically like they are perfectionists they want amazing sessions week in week out and i can see their pain when a pole vault session doesn't go 100 percent or exactly the way that we had planned it um and it's like just trying to teach them as well that you know this this one pole vault session doesn't define the winter training or it doesn't define the season if you know what i mean um and even having a little dip um it's it's important to go through them and like you know we have them if you know what i mean it's what makes us stronger if you know what i mean if it all goes perfectly and if it was all easy everybody would do it if you know what i mean so the mental toughness side of it as well as the physical of actually feeling tired and turning up to training and doing everything that you can to make yourself feel good for those technical sessions and the sacrifices you make um yeah finding the balance between social life and and having a life outside of it like i i often talk about the different components in your life like if your education's going well your friendship groups might be going well family you know it's there's always other things in your life that you have to make sure is happening around and it's not just pole vault focused like it is just pole vault <laughs> yeah and just just sort of going on a broader scale did you notice that obviously going into winter did you know there was different changes in your training or you know I, I, did you notice any differences during those sort of winter months essentially as a coach and as an, ath- as an athlete from both perspectives like I remember in rugby I was like okay we're going into winter now we've got a bit of a break in the season um, but leading up to it you sort of lowering the reps because you know it's going to be tougher the weather's going to be harder the, the ground's going to be muddier so you're more prone to injuries we could see the load going down in the gym Mm. just to manage that i was wondering if you have you know either changed programming as a coach or experienced that change in programming as an athlete yeah i mean as an athlete um yeah there was definitely like physical changes as well so like as you might be in a different phase you might be a little bit slower and heavier so like i used to be able to put on a bit of mass um in my winter training i remember going through that phase going oh i feel heavy um but it was again just a phase like um that i had to go through and like i then learned to have like a winter training weight and a, a a competition weight um and then yeah constantly adapting like run sessions that you like if you do have to do them outside if it's going to be cold and wet you're not going to get the same out of it do you need to adapt that session actually and bring it inside or do you stick to the program I think quite often as coaches we get stuck stuck in I've written the program you need to see it and the athletes are same if they've seen the program they need to tick every box on that program in order to get through I'm like actually guys I'm going to cut the session short today you look tired <laughs> I mean and they're like whoa <laughs> if you know what I mean they don't like it um and, not before uh, the thousand meter reps though those gotta stay <laughs> <laughs> they they are the most important <laughs> um so yeah making judgment calls is really important like i can write a program on paper but seeing it like map out i have to be able to adapt to it um and i've learned that a hell of a lot more as a coach than i probably did as an athlete again i was probably the same athlete as the ones i coach and i wanted to complete every part of the program otherwise i felt like i was cheating in some way um whereas like learning to train smart rather than hard is the two different lessons to learn Hmm. Uh, you mentioned there like lots of lots of changes kind of going into winter and and or you know your pole vault then kind of takes a hit because you're working either on different aspects or you're just the build up of fatigue because you're going hard in the gym um and i was talking to some other some other coaches like in the endurance group who struggle whose athletes sometimes can struggle with like kind of comparing themselves to where they were in the summer so if they think like comparisons yeah yeah <laughs> like i i'm training to get better than i was in the summer but i'm worse yeah. now than i was in the summer or things aren't going as well like how how do you deal with that um as as a coach to keep like to kind of get the in their minds that this isn't you know not being able yeah to i think the biggest asset I can ever 
sort of have as a coach now is I've been there, if you know what I mean. And like, I can feel their pain. I can feel their questions. I can feel like why, you know, like, as you say, you're an athlete, you constantly, I used to compare myself. Well, I could use this pole like eight weeks ago in competition and now I can't use it now in a, in a heavy training block or I'm trying to make a technical change. So I actually need to, I can't do it on that pole right now, which is a competition pole, which I'm coming in with a hundred miles an hour adrenaline, if you know what I mean. Um, so I think, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just learning as an athlete and a coach that you have to accept where you are and like, and if the numbers are constantly going down, then you're worrying, but they're stabilizing. That's fine. Like, um, if you're making changes, you know, sometimes you have to go backwards to go forwards. If you know what I mean, sometimes you have to be a bit more disciplined and stay a little bit longer on that shorter run up while you're still making, like if the change isn't quite ingrained and it's, it's different, obviously coaching different levels of athletes. Cause like, um, some athletes, it's just about a process to get them from A to B. Whereas, um, that process definitely more with elite athletes is not such a straight line. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just so interesting. Cause uh, like the athletics, the more I'm getting into athletics, the, the crazier it is. And that mm. off season is so short. Like you said, 12 weeks, but you got Christmas at the end of that. And that's 12 weeks. If you only take, you know, two weeks off and then you got the indoor season. And then that kind of weird in between indoor and outdoor. Like if, if we talked about that, section where you have kind of what between three and six weeks is it between kind of indoor and outdoor what, what yeah I mean that section is like you don't need to go as deep I don't think if you know what I mean you need to kind of just top up especially with the girls girls can learn that they could um lose a little bit more strength than the lads if you know what I mean in the competition season the lucky thing for the competition season indoors it's again only about six weeks normally six to, six to eight weeks maximum um so you know if you've programmed right you should easily see yourself through that by and being able to um back off a little bit physically during that time but then yeah it's a bit of a top-up season um obviously the winter summer season can be very very long mm. if you know what I mean and so like the the better level athlete you are the later you're probably open and so like you know the depending on the calendar but normally like the major championships is you know either end of july beginning of august sometimes even late august so you're going to plan your season around that so that will then determine how long your spring prep is but you know i like to get a nine week physical block in so three three week blocks mm. so we kind of do uh, four week blocks in the winter and three week blocks in the summer and you know they're going to get become general prep to specific prep to more specific prep if you know what I mean mm. um so yeah you're right that that time is short but I just feel like with that one quite often we go warm weather training you know it's broken up like as you say that 12 weeks of winter training is short but there's nothing else in it <laughs> train 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 yeah, yeah. and you know like again the more serious you take it like we would I used to go home for two days at Christmas mm um and then i'd be back in on boxing day or the day after 27th i i was nuts me and steve lewis we were both he was from stoke i was a bit further north and we used to travel home the same day and be back two or three days later petrified obviously we had an amazing setup in loughborough if you know what i mean and i was i'd take christmas day off if you want the amount of athletes that train on christmas day i trained on christmas day <laughs> why <laughs> go spend it with your families <laughs> um but because the indoor season was looming, right. if you know what I mean, yeah. and we'd quite often start. Um, and I, I believe in taking like if you take a week off now, it's it, like not even you can do some basic training in that week. I think it's good for the mind. Mm. You actually get to switch off for more than two days. And maybe that's where I went wrong sometimes, mm. but um, not learning to switch off. But and how yeah. how do you so like goal setting is obviously really important. And they're like you have different goals for different areas of either training or the season. How do you balance? Well, first of all, how do you come and deal with different athletes who are coming from different seasons? Some are coming, you know, from terrible seasons and are really low motivated. Some are coming from unreal seasons or coming kind of off of a season high. How do you how do you balance that and then go? These are our short term goals into the winter. And then these yeah. are our long term goals for the season. Um, and for one, not getting carried away with it with, you know, someone who's had an amazing season. And the other side, yeah. like someone who's dreading 12 weeks of training because their season's just been trash. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's it's tough. And again, like I've only been full time for like this is my second year in it full time. And I feel like I'm doing a better job this year. First year, I think I spent too much time watching sessions that I didn't need to watch, whereas now I'm spending a lot more time planning. So, you know, I try and do a review with every athlete um, at the end of the season um, where we sit down and make all those goals. But now this year I've been doing a better job of actually checking in with the athletes at at least monthly, if you know what I mean, Mm. Um, which is something I think we forget to do sometimes. Like you sit down, you do this big review, what went well, what didn't, how are we going to get to the next steps? You plan it all out and you look at it in a year's time. (laughs) Did we do it? It's a bit late. (laughs) Or sometimes I do a bit of a review after indoor season when we plan for the summer, but again, too late. So I'm trying to do a better review of actually, you know, um, sitting down with the athletes, um, you know, how are we doing? Are we on track for where we want to be? Um, as you say, are there little goals that we need to hit? Some athletes like goals, some athletes don't. Um, athletes that, sometimes the athletes that haven't had a good season are the ones that are most motivated, if you know what I mean, because it's gone wrong. So like the job's done. I don't need to be their motivator. They are so driven that year. It's the ones that like, if you've had an amazing season, you've got to pick yourself back up and do it all again. That's the tough one. Um, because you then got to try and move on again. Are you moving on or are you consolidating? Um, what is the next goal? Like, and as I say, the higher you get, the the smaller the percentages to like their peak, if you know what I mean. And the more finer details um, need to be addressed. And like, yeah, it, it becomes more and more intense. Like, there's nothing better, nothing better. But like, I remember as an athlete. The year after injury, the pressure's off, if you know what I mean. I've had, I've been injured. Like, I remember having surgery. And so I had surgery in 2008. And then, as you said, 2009 was my year. And the pressure was off. Like, uh, I was flying. Like, I, part of it, my coach gave me a kick up the bum and said, what the hell are you playing at? <laughs> You've had a year full of injuries and you're still jumping well. Why, like, you could do so much more, if you know what I mean? But the other side of it is... You know, I, I've been injured. I've hate, had it taken away from me. I had so much drive to get it back and not piss about so much. So, yeah. Do you, so would you say this might be a long shot? But so would you say that injury was um, not a blessing in disguise? But do you think it just helped you realize that look, I'm I can actually take it with both hands and go as far as I want with it. Yeah. Every athlete is going to get injured at some point. Unfortunately, if you're going to try and compete at an elite level, there's a risk of injury. And we, you know, we're not psychic. We can't always, you can do all the screening in the world, but, and we can try and put all the things in place to avoid injuries, but you're going to get some niggles. Some of them are bigger. Some of them aren't, Um, you know, the, the better you are or the closer you are to your peak, the, the smaller the margins are. So you're pushing yourself to get to that peak. Um, and yes, from every injury, I completely believe you can learn something. And athletes become better athletes after they've had a big, better injury. Sorry, a big injury. You know, they take care of themselves. They don't. They don't skip the rehab. They don't skip the prehab. They don't skip the cool downs. You know, they're constantly looking after themselves. They don't want that again. So they become more disciplined athletes after that. I mean, I, yeah. I mean, it's it's like a Formula One car. All these cars have spent five million you know dollars on these cars this whole time and then they're running at 100 percent output and everyone wonders oh why do they break down if they're you know they spent all this money all, all this time making the car and it's obviously because you're running it max the whole time um max. it's gonna mm. one part's gonna break down so yeah if you're willing to compete and get to that next level you might have to deal with some uh, hardship you can't just run 100 percent full year round eh? um and then yeah. another bit was like just long term because obviously in an olympics cycle you've got four years which means you've got four yep. sort of off seasons or like a couple weeks where you can do it did that planning change like did you notice that your coach Stephen, planned on a four-year cycle sometimes so you'd have like use those each wintering parts as a yep. goal setting like little goals then and there was like a big goal in those four years and how did you plan over that sort of macro schedule Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, like being British is like a blessing and a curse. The blessing is we've always got a goal because we've either got Commonwealth, Europeans, Worlds or Olympics. And like the four year cycle of Olympics every other year. So like if Olympics is 08, then we'd have Worlds 2007, 9, 11, if you know what I mean. Um, And then the other thing with us is we then would have Europeans and Commonwealths they used to be Europeans every four years and then they switched every two. So even in, if you're not going to make it to the Olympics, you've got Europeans the same year now. Um, And so there was always a big goal. Um, 
and sometimes I mean the problem with Commonwealth as well is you know it's opportunity to well I, I was at best a world finalist I wasn't a world medalist I wasn't an Olympic medalist uh, my peak was making finals if you know what I mean which then Commonwealths and Europeans gave me a chance to try and shoot for medals so they became just as important as the world's and the Olympics on the global scene. So it was just a year by year. You do find obviously athletes when they retire quite often, there's a big drop off after Olympics because you kind of you go to the Olympics and then like you might retire, but if you don't, you do another world. And then it's like, oh, but there's Europeans next year, oh, but there's this. And so there's a four year cycle of when athletes actually stop, I think. Um, there's not many that unless they're forced out with injury that seem to stop if, two, if the Olympics is two years out and that's their goal. but. Yeah, but obviously, if you're um, American, you don't do Commonwealths. Obviously, if you're Canadian, you don't do Europeans, if you know what I mean. Like, um, we do it all. And but I think that makes it tough because you don't often get an opportunity to just have a year of fun and then not be a big major to go through. Whereas like, like, I remember Christian Taylor's like Olympic um, triple jump champion, world champion this far off the Jonathan Edwards world record. But like in the year where he didn't have to do like uh, Worlds or Olympics, he used to go run 400s. He was bloody good at that as well. He ran 45-0, which is nuts. But like he just, he, he was that talented. But I'm just saying he did another event for half the year. He still triple jumped a bit, but there was no big goal. So he had that, as you said, that four-year planning cycle rather than a um, where he could have a download year, if you know what I mean. Um, which I think can be, and again, like you have the pressures of funding as well. Like if we don't perform every year, if you are on funding, you, you're off. I mean, it's different now and you might get two years or whatever, but the pressures to like the higher up you go, the more pressures you go. If you've got your Nike contract, you have to deliver for them. If you know what I mean, if you've got uh, funding, you've got to deliver for them. And like the whole mindset can change for like pressures to deliver rather than trying to jump as high as you can <laughs> for you, so if you know what I mean. Yeah, so I guess would would it be a sort of detriment then having all those? So do you think those like the, the Americans have a benefit um, not having to perform at all these different competitions now that the Euros are two instead of four years? Um, do you see that as yeah more more than a, a curse than a benefit or? I think it's a benefit for them. Um, like it was interesting, obviously, with all the COVID and then the, all the championships got ski whiffed and then all of a sudden, as a Brit, you had Europeans, Commonwealths and Worlds in a year and everyone was like, oh, which ones are you doing? And then a bunch went for all three and still performed. It was absolutely crazy. I don't know what at what cost the following year, if you know what I mean, but they managed to get through it. Quite often you had someone who went to the Worlds, flopped and then came out of the Europeans and performed. So um but yeah as you said um the americans only had one that year and they could just target it i mean it's kind of shit or bust but yeah i guess i guess as an snc coach um you see it as a point of like they just you just have to make sure they peak at that one point you know at the right to where for you you probably have to peak at so many different points so it's hard to have like a macro goal because you have to it, it, it fluctuates yeah. a lot between competitions depending on how you perform at those competitions yeah. then yeah, and I remember in 2010 was another solid year for me. Um, and I'd finished sixth at the Europeans, which was the big goal. But Commonwealth, again, can be at different times. And the Commonwealth were in October. October is obviously normally like um, you're in week, week two or three, if you know what I mean, of training. You've had like three weeks off, four weeks off or whatever. So like I think I finished the whole season, took like a week off and then got back into a bit of early season. Anyway, it didn't quite pan out. I was, I flunked, like I got my bronze medal there, but I should have won it. Um, and it was just, we couldn't quite get it right. Um, and I don't know how many athletes did get it right. Quite often the athletes that didn't perform so well at Europeans did, then did better at commies, you know. So planning can be crazy. Normally I'd say, you know, you plan for your majors. If you're at under 23 level, it's probably in July. That's where you're going to try and peak. Normally for the seniors, it's August. And we kind of got to have that double peak because you've got to make the team. But again, we're not American. So the blessing is the Americans have to try and make the team at the end of June and then perform again um, in o August or whatever it is. Whereas generally, and other than the distance and some of the sprint events, we've not got more than three per event. So <laughs> yeah.
So, so me mentioning the the third place in the Commonwealth right off the top. That was a, <laughs> that, she, we almost lost her right at the beginning, thirty seconds in. <laughs> I'm out of here. I don't need that. Yeah, no, that was a, it was a. I mean, I was grateful for the medal. Like, I nearly completely flunked it. Luckily, <laughs> someone else flunked it as well. So uh, <laughs> we sat on the program podium crying together. But no, it wasn't quite that bad. Where where it was, was it? Where was it that it was in October? Delhi. Oh. Yeah. So everyone had their deli belly as well. <laughs> I was going to say the food must. It was an interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it was an interesting commies. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I guess like planning, you would mentioned that you've changed the last two years now being full time coach. Of uh, you noticed that um, you're it's less being at sessions that maybe you don't need to be at and more checking on that uh, in on athletes. And I was wondering when it comes to like managing athletes over the course of a winter training that have different needs or different goals um is that a way that you find helps you manage those is is more check-ins or how do you how do you manage that with yeah i think that's probably one of the biggest biggest challenges and i think one of your questions when i read it was what are the biggest challenges you have and and that is it is um managing that managing different athletes obviously like I have a key group if you know what I mean and everybody works well together um but yeah I think checking in is the big thing but writing programs like you know even just having boys and girls they're just two different specimens (laughs) like like the two sorry two different species um like they they want different things they need different things obviously I am quite tuned into the psyche of female athletes and I get the emotional side of it I get I get their thoughts their feelings it's just natural and obviously as a coach um I first started coaching guys straight away um when I first started coaching and and I didn't maybe I just didn't take it as seriously then but I don't remember having some of the challenges I have now with a group of boys and you know they're they are motivated by different things they're very number driven they're very this driven um and so it's sort of still learning to tap into their psyche um, and what makes them tick and finding a good balance. Like they need a, a, a sort of high upbeat training group, whereas some of the girls like, you know, Tilly can just grind it out. She wants to be part of a group, but she can still grind it out like on her own, if you know what I mean. Mm. Some of them have a better, some of the girls have are better at that and just getting on with it. And, you know, they've got their goal in their head. Um but yeah, it's, it, I think checking in is the most important. Me checking in on their goals, tinkering programs so that like, and every athlete has like a niggle, if you know what I mean. They have their little Achilles heel, whether it's a, I don't know, Achilles, whether it's shins, whether it's calves, whether it's hip, back, mm. foot, if you know what I mean. And then you're like, rather than write 12 different programs, you try and put little bits for each of the athletes in those programs so that it's there. I mean, generally you're then covering all bases because they've all got different issues, but, um, but then, yeah. And again, some, you know, I, I write a completely different week map for the lads. Um, this year I've taken on Sophie Cook as well. Um, who again is, she's 29. Mm-hmm. I think she'll shoot me if she's 28, but um, she's 29. So it's again, writing programs for different ages Mm. as well. Um, So most of the work I've done in the past is, you know, athletes from 18 to 25, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, yeah, taking on athletes that are further in their career, like the the details again, it definitely becomes less about physical um, and more about the small changes. Um, You can't, yeah, you can't reintroduce too much physical with an older athlete. Yeah, our old 29-year-old knees can't take it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's brutal. So <laughs> brutal. <laughs> yeah. Would you say um just as as like a developing coach, uh is would you say that is kind of the biggest thing that you want to improve as or improve on as a coach is, is your ability to kind of understand the needs and manage the needs of your athletes or what would you say is your, your kind of the biggest thing that you would want to? Yeah, I think it's both. I think it, that is one of them. Um, I think it's, yeah, learning, learning to manage their needs, learning, you know, you, you're in many different roles as a coach, if mm. you know what I mean? Um, so that, um, and then also just like, just never stop learning. I think I was, I've obviously been very blessed that I've in my coaching career over the last few years, I've had Scott Simpson on my doorstep, who I rate as one of the best pole vault coaches in the world. 
Um, and so quite often, whenever I've needed something, I've just gone there. And so I think part of me is to like broaden my knowledge as well in terms of um, there's lots of different ways of doing it, learning to filter out what I don't need to listen to. Mm. Um, I quite often take too much on and you think too many ideas and are all great and sticking to my own path, if you know what I mean, like if you do take on too much. So it's it's keeping eyes and ears open, filtering lots, um, checking in with athletes, learning to adapt to different needs. I'm still, yeah, as you say, developing coach, got lots to learn. <laughs> We'll have to get you on in like three years when we're super big time. Yeah. And oh, yeah. Uh, see see how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It'll be it'll be different. I mean, I did. I remember doing a pod this time last year, and I was sort of on cloud nine. I'd had a fantastic year with Ellie and Owen, and I'm not saying I thought I knew it all, but I was like, yeah, I've got this. And then it's like <laughs> another year in, you're like, oh, I've got so much more to learn. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, and then just on like one of the last bits. I was just wondering how you use nutrition and sports science in your training and how, as you said, like there was times during winter when um, there was like a weight gain um, and then how like nutritionally that changed or any consider considerations you had to alter your nutrition for yeah. that time period. Yeah, I mean, as an athlete on funding, I had access to nutrition and a lot of support around that. Um if I'm completely honest, I, f I used, I listened to what I could listen to and found my own way. Um, but I suppose it was great having the support, you know, we had skin folds done that could keep, like, so if I was gaining weight, I knew that it wasn't just, I wasn't just eating rubbish, if you know what I mean, I was gaining muscle mass. So it was good to have um, that information and be like, okay, just accept you, you're going to train a bit heavier now because you're carrying extra muscle. But you know, and then being able to monitor that throughout the summer and, you know, if I got lighter or, you know, and also finding the balance of becoming too light, if you know what I mean, like at the end of the day, mass moves mass. And um, I was a very light, petite, petite bolter in that side, sense of things. And if you got too small, um, you know, like you risk of injury then, if you know what I mean. So um, it was great having that to monitor. Like we got, we got a lot of um, support with speed data, probably, more so more so in competition back in the day as an athlete like now i feel like everything's on our doorstep like i can test speed myself with the guys to truth from gates if you know what i mean like i don't have to rely on other people to constantly get data um being in a university setup like the university athletes have access to everything like obviously world-class athletes do as well but just on their doorstep like um you want to get numbers for uh, cmjs yep cool book it in if you know what i mean you want to get reactivity uh, drop jumps yet book it in and obviously I don't get that for everybody but there's a lot around me and I've still been learning to like absorb that data like I think it was almost put on me um, a year or two ago and I didn't really understand the data because I didn't have the data as an athlete so it's sort of learning to understand the data digest it what is it for um, how relevant is it like I think you know data can drop and athletes read a lot into that as well um, and it could just mean you're tired that day <laughs> you know what I mean and if you're only going to test four times a year and one of them drops and like ah, like everybody's shouting and screaming so um yeah i think as long as there's um the curves going upwards mm. i don't really mind what it says and it's maybe protecting athletes from a little bit of data as well and not too much because i think uh, scott always tells me it's measuring it's not testing if you know what i mean it's just where are we if yeah. you know what i mean and yeah. are we making too many mistakes or mm. Yeah, that that leads into so, what I was going to ask of just like sports science in general, because like you said, there's especially at Loughborough and if you're on world class or you have a lot of things at your doorstep that you can use. And you're you you as a coach, you write your SNC programs for your athletes and there's SNC coaches as well. And um, yeah. nutritionists, uh, me uh, <clears throat> always asking you for athletes and <laughs> <laughs> to, to do my studies. Um, uh, and I guess like. As sports scientists, we like to we love our numbers, and sometimes we don't do a very good job of of uh, speaking to coaches or building that relationship or understanding how how they can help us and how we can maybe help them. Uh, like I guess, as sports scientists, as Matt and I, like what would you what would you say as a coach helps? Like how how can we better support coaches by you know how we um, I guess how we 
bring our data or how we bring our questions or our asks to coaches? Yeah, um, good question. I suppose it's like, I mean, obviously when you get base data, there's not a lot you can do with it, can you? It's the first time you're gathering data, all you can do is report it. Um, I think quite often, I was probably, everyone I think probably assumed I knew what it was. Um, and maybe I was too afraid to ask. This was a couple of years ago. Um, and I thought, you know, as a developing coach, I should know everybody's getting data, if you know what I mean. So maybe it's the element of um, like not presuming, if you know what I mean. So like talking through what it means. Like, again, obviously, if you, it's, it's a conversation. And obviously, I know not everybody has time. And this is sometimes why I sometimes get frustrated is I'm a people person. So I like to get to know the person who's collecting the data. And then we can constantly bounce ideas off each other. And it's and it's an open dialogue. And I think often everybody's busy, like that's the downfall of Love Brothers. They look after so many people. So you get your data. Here it is. Green, red or blue. <laughs> I mean, green, red or orange or whatever. Um, and uh, yeah, and and then yeah you need to be more explosive or you need to be this this and this and i think like well okay let's have the conversation so this is base date data if you know what i mean um the athletes have done nothing for two weeks so is this okay actually like this is a i've only got one of the data point from may last year this is a little bit lower what do you think or mm. you know is uh, is that looking actually there's a massive imbalance there like actually just being able to talk through it i think rather than just seeing and reading and digesting it. Because again, you guys are so busy, lots of people to give the data to, but we're so busy like reading through everybody's data. You know, I collected data from England Athletics this, this weekend and it was great data, but I haven't had a chance to scrutinize everybody, if you know what I mean, um, and see if there's any anomalies, if you know what I mean, and just saying, like, oh, there's a little alarm bell there, if you know what I mean, and actually then there's a big imbalance between left and right, that kind of thing um so, so I th i'd say that's it it's more like that that conversation i think as as like academics we can be very bad at at just like being in our own head and just spitting stuff out and not yeah. you know because we're like oh yeah everyone knows this boom you know and just like, yeah. and we you know <laughs> we've been staring at it for months and months so for us it's just second nature but like you said yeah. like yeah we're busy but also you know if we want to if we want to generate those relationships long term, taking that like the time to make sure that they understand it, or, or and like... and that's it for us. It's the long term, and I get so frustrated in athletics as the turnover. Mm. Like when I first started and I started working S and I think it was Nathan bought a, bought up a massive rapport with him, and then like he got promoted. Yeah, <laughs> just like, and then it was somebody else, and then you're trying to learn to do like connect with someone else and they they're learning their job and i think quite often when people come into our field of athletics it's like oh my goodness this isn't one sport this is like 16 sports in one yeah. you know what i mean they all want different stuff they all do it differently every coach doesn't talk to another coach like yeah. you know there's three four different jumps coaches in, in loughborough if you know what i mean we don't all connect <laughs> you know what i mean um and then you guys are just dealing with us separately and athletics is a minefield in itself if you know what i mean as you say like endurance is so far away from jumps jumps is so far away from you know throws if you know what i mean so mm. yeah <laughs> yeah yeah no it is i it's insane like because i don't come from an athletics background and getting into it over the last year it's just how do you do it like forget about <laughs> forget about just your athletes then it's yeah. like you said different coaches in the same event and then and then you know but and then endurance has how many events in it it's it's yeah. insane yeah it is insane yeah well we Completely. we really really appreciate you coming on um yeah, this, been this has been awesome we have <laughs> one more thing with matt which is quick fire questions which we always oh, do God, no. so they can <laughs> they, they, matt loves throwing curve balls i wish it, oh, exactly. it's so but it's fun it's fun and i'm just glad it's not me because <laughs> you really <laughs> hit to me <laughs> taking the question no but, okay but yeah this is the last thing but but before we do that we just really wanted to thank you for your time it's been unbelievable yeah thank you um, yeah thank yeah. you for having me it's been great <laughs> matt take it away oh um yeah as david said these are just some quick fire ones but i remember last time just throwing in some deep deep uh questions as well so <laughs> yeah i don't know what will come I'm up i'm so but, um... nervous right now my heart's going back <laughs> <laughs> um did, did you have any nicknames? Or do no, you I was Deno. 
I was Deno, Deno. which is so weird because like I've been in love for so long. Some people could still call me Deno. So Scott uh-huh. will still call me Deno from being Kate Dennison. And then like my yeah. athletes only know me as Kate Rooney. And they're like, what? Exactly. So yeah, <laughs> Deno. There you go. What's the main or one thing you missed from when you were competing? <laughs> Just the adrenaline and the buzz. Um, I don't miss it as in like, I don't want to ever, I'm, I don't miss competing. I, I probably live a lot through my athletes at the moment, but, <laughs> um, yeah, just, just that adrenaline, that challenge, that nerves, like, I can't believe I miss nerves if you know what I mean. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, what item is worth spending money on? <sighs> don't talk to me about that. I have a, a trainer fetish. But I, I buy junior trainers. So in girl maths, I never spend more than fifty pounds for a pair of trainers. Your trainers, to be fair, I've heard are, that. are on point. I told, yeah. I was, I was speaking to Tilly yesterday, like the other day. I was like, "Do you see, do you see Kate's trainers?" <laughs> I actually think they're the ones you're wearing this morning, like the Nike, yeah, the Nike I, ones. Yeah, I love them. And but I, I, I buy the junior range, so um, I got small count. feet, which means that I can buy oh, three yeah. when instead of uh, one. Uh, so yeah, so yeah <laughs> that's coming weird. with six boxes, you're like. <laughs> black friday junior i've got that a lot um, basically when my son's finally my pair. size f- feet <laughs> he's on he's on point <laughs> yeah. um sum up being an athlete in a sentence or a word oh my goodness um being an athlete this is why we got to uh, leave five minutes for quick fire questions. Yeah, this is tough. I think they're all a little bit crazy. They're um, all a little bit crazy. A little bit cuckoo. Best athletes are usually a little bit crazy. <laughs> That's funny. And then how did you cope through the tough times? Like any advice or just like how did you cope through those tough times? during? I don't practice? know if I did. No. <laughs> um, I think I think it's about balance. And I, I've always said this, like I think the one thing that got th- me through when I was going tough in athletics, you know, like I, either my relationship might be going well or, you know, I've got something else going on other than athletics. It's not to be um, so focused, like have family around you, have friends around you, you know, have people outside of sport that you can turn to or like don't really get it. Mm. <laughs> so like they're like, why are you so upset? You had a bad day. <laughs> no, I mean, they don't they don't get it and they bring you back down. So, yeah, I still mm. have that now when I like if it's, it's, it's been a bit of a rubbish week at the track or whatever, or a rubbish day and everyone's flopped a bit because they're tired. And then you just go meet your mates and they're like, OK, <laughs> <laughs> that's all good. Yeah, it just helps you. Um bring any bring everything back to perspective because yeah i'll say like exactly. i remember losing um like it was a pretty important rugby game i wasn't playing but as a as a coach just seeing the boys lose and i was gutted went out with my friends who who've been in london you know business the whole time um at like a normal job and yeah i was just like gutted and they were like like and i swear you got a game next week and i was like yeah that's yeah. true and then it's like oh true yeah. fair enough i and try so, yeah yeah, I think I try and have this physical thing that like I, it was easier in the winter, but I get to the track, I try and hang my coat up and leave family life at home. And then like when I leave the track, you know, you hang, you hang your coat up again and you try and shut the door on the, the mm. track as well. So try not to bring it all home with you. Oh, that's that's really good. good. What what a great little quote to end off. Holy smoke. <laughs> that's incredible. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah. Kate, we really, really appreciate uh, appreciate your time again. And and if it if we ever get around to it, we'll have to get Matt up and you'll have to see if we can get, get over it. Can't the wait. I need to get the two of you pole vault in. Yeah. It's gonna be amazing. I, yeah. <laughs> I don't think you've got pole vaults that will handle what I'm gonna bring. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm sure. Be... I'm sure we have. You... We'll go grab a pool noodle. We'll go grab a pool yeah. noodle. I'm, be... start with that. I'm just going to be perfectly balanced, stuck on the top like this, guys. Just perfectly aligned. Help me! <laughs> yeah. no, just full. Just full. Uh, the wait. opposite way. <laughs> yeah. The wrong way. Yeah. Track landing. Uh, thanks, Brilliant. Kate. Have a great no, thank rest you very of much. your evening. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, guys. Cheers. Bye bye. <laughs>